Welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. With these webinars, we hope to share useful information from local and international peers about the latest digital techniques, data and tools in support of Australian bioscientists delivering their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. We appreciate those of you joining us live today and you'll have the opportunity to ask our speaker questions via the Q&A function on your dashboard and these will be addressed at the end of the presentation. This session will be recorded and if you'd like to revisit it in the future, you'll find it on our YouTube channel, along with recordings of previous webinars and workshops. We hope you'll keep in touch to hear about future webinars via the channels listed on the screen. Before we start today, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and pay our respect to the elders past, present and emerging. We'd also like to acknowledge the heartbreaking start we've had to 2020 with fires in many places around Australia and resolve to help where we can. The relevance and necessity for bioscience and bioinformatics research right now is obvious, so we forge ahead. On a brighter note, we're thrilled to have these guests with us today. Associate Professor Bernard Pope is a computer scientist and bioinformatician at the University of Melbourne. His research focuses on applying computational techniques to biological questions, especially related to human genomics and cancer. After completing a computer science and PhD in programming languages, Bernie undertook an internship at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, before then taking up a lecturing position at the University of Melbourne. Now part of Melbourne Bioinformatics, Bernie has led a team of bioinformaticians in cancer and clinical genomics, and he's contributed to a wide variety of research projects. In 2017, Bernie was awarded a Victorian Health and Medical Research Fellowship funded by the Victorian Government in support of his work on the prevention and treatment of colorectal cancer in close collaboration with the Colorectal Oncogenomics Group at the University of Melbourne. In addition to his research, Bernie is an enthusiastic educator with extensive experience teaching at the university level. We're very pleased to have Bernie here today to talk about a recent project to lower the barrier for entry in bioinformatics software development without compromising good programming practices. We'll hear about the tool that automates the process of building new bioinformatics software projects following recommended best practices in BioInitio, building better bioinformatics tools with batteries included. Uh, thanks everyone and um, thanks for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, as Christina mentioned, we're going to be talking about BioInitio which is a tool for building better bioinformatics tools with batteries included. So many of you will have already been aware of the so-called scientific software crisis. And on this page, we see the headlines of um, many manuscripts <clears throat> that have been published in the literature outlining some of the issues faced. Um, and uh, we can see that um, there's a lot of interest in this area um, and a lot of potential problems related to the development of software for science. And in bioinformatics, um, we have many people who are interested in creating software who um, do not always have a background in software development. And so um, that can create an issue for um, the development of good tools. Um, however, and fortunately, there's help is at hand. And you can see, again, relating to this literature is uh, many, many publications um, suggesting um, uh, things that we can do about it. Um, and uh, many of them are 10 simple rules type papers um, that have been published. Um, so there are lots of rep recommendations in the literature about how to address this problem. Um, but um, these recommendations are spread over many papers. Um, and I guess one of the issues is they only partially overlap with their recommendations. Um, which can cause confusion for somebody trying to figure out what they ought to do when they're developing their bioinformatics software. And I, I think advice is useful, so it's great that these publications exist, um, but action is better. So that leads us to BioInitio. So what is BioInitio? Um, it's a software tool for starting new bioinformatics software projects following recommended best practices. Um, and it supports 12 different programming languages. Um, most of the common um, programming languages are covered by BioInitio, particularly those that are popular in, in bioinformatics. And in today's webinar, we're going to focus on the use of BioInitio for creating a Python project, but the ideas that we discuss here are relevant to all the other programming languages that are supported by BioInitio. If you're interested in 
details about the languages that are supported, you can have a look at our public, recent publication in the Giga Science Journal. Um, and you can also check out our um, page on GitHub um, here, which uh, covers um, some of the more technical details. So what is Bionitio practically? Um, well, the idea is that with one command, users can start a new well-structured project and the command is illustrated here. Um, so you can see that we're running the bioinitio boot.shell script and we specify the name of the project we want to create and the, and the programming language that we want to use. In this case and throughout these slides, we're going to be using a project called, an example project called Skynet. Um, and the programming language we're going to use is Python. Of course, you can choose your own project name and you can choose one of the 12 different programming languages. So what you get after running this is a functional software artifact that provides a working example of best practices and it also serves as a template for making new tools. So it's, it's really intended that you create a new working project and then you modify it for your own purposes. So what does the new project do that, that gets created by Bionitio? Well, it creates um, a simple bioinformatics application that carries out a, a, a task that's um, typical of what you might do in bioinformatics. It's um, simple enough that it can be understood relatively quickly and complex enough that it has all of the main features that you would see in a good bioinformatics project. Um, in these slides, the dollar sign indicates the Unix command line prompt. Um, it might differ on your computer depending on how it's configured. Um, and in the rest of the slides, as I mentioned, um, the example project we're going to be creating is called Skynet um, in a reference to the Terminator movies. Um, and so what you can see the example project doing is that you run the command Skynet or whatever your project is called and you pass it some FASTA files, in this case two different FASTA files. It reads those files and then computes some summary statistics about the contents of the files and then prints the information out in tabular format at the end. Um, the point of this example program is it's not expected to be uh, terribly useful to anybody as it is. It's really just a demonstration and a vehicle from which we can um, include all of the features that we need. Um, but the point is after you would have created your project with uh, Bionitio, you would go off and modify this for whatever purposes that you uh, want to do. Or you could use it just as a teaching tool. You could um, study the code and um, understand how things fit together. So what are the features that are built into this example program? Um, so there's, there's lots and lots of useful things that come with the template program and here's a list of um, the prominent ones. Um, but please refer to our Giga Science paper for a full description of these. So you get command line argument parsing, as we'll see um, later in, the, in, in these slides as we demonstrate the use of the, the program. You get process logging, which is um, an output to a file that has timestamps uh, uh, for actions that occur in the programs and it summarizes key milestones. Um, it reports the command line arguments that we use to run the program. And process logging, progress logging is really useful for debugging purposes um, and is often not uh, provided in um, applications. So it's nice that it's there as well. Um, the program has a defined exit status value, so they're, they're defined in the, the code um, as constants uh, and they're recorded in the documentation. Um, and this is quite useful if the program gets used in a workflow where the exit status values will be used to determine the um, success or failure of the execution of the program. It includes test suite, um, unit tests and integration tests. And we'll look at um, the test suite uh, in today's webinar, particularly uh, connecting it to continuous integration testing. And obviously the test suite is good for um, checking the program is doing what you expect it to do. And it's one of the things we often leave out when we're writing bioinformatics programs, especially when we're writing short scripts, which we don't think will be useful, um, particularly beyond our immediate task, but often those things grow into useful tools and having a test suite from the beginning is a, is a good thing to do. It has a defined version number, um, which can be printed out on the command line. Um, and that is useful for provenance of the application. So if somebody uses the program within an analysis, they can report the version number and that helps with um, reproducibility. It contains software packaging and a Docker container 
Packaging depends on the programming language that's been used. In today's um, webinar, we'll see how it works with Python, but it's obviously different for different programming languages. And we use the standard packaging systems that come with the programming languages where available. Um, Docker is a virtualization system that allows you to package up software and its dependencies into a single unit, which aids for um, use and uh, reusability. Um, and can sometimes make the software easier to use on different um, systems. Um, and so that comes with uh, the uh, template. So you get a working Docker container, um, which you can then obviously adapt to your own purposes if you change the program. Uh, it comes with a standard open source license, and you can choose amongst some standard licenses when you create your project with BioInitio. Um, and that's useful for making sure that the code is um, easy to share amongst others. Um, it has documentation in the form of um, a readme file, which explains what the program does and how to use it um, and some key information for users. Um, and we'll see that briefly today. Uh, we also include support for revision control with Git and optionally GitHub. Um, and uh, revision control allows you to keep track of the changes in your software to work with others and incorporate features into the program in a systematic and um, understandable way. And um, BioInitio, um, as we'll see today, helps you automate the process of setting up a new repository um, as well. And lastly, um, it features a wrapper for the common workflow language, which is useful if you want to use your tool in um, standard pipelines uh, or allow it to be used by others in a standard way. We won't be talking about the wrapper for the common workflow language in today's webinar. However, please see our uh, GigaScience paper if you'd like to see more information about that. So, as I mentioned, um, what we're going to do today is create a new project with BioInitio, and we're going to use this program called BioInitio boot.sh, which is a bash shell script, and it's the program that you run to create new projects. At a minimum, it requires the name of the new project and the programming language to be specified, as we saw in the previous example. So here we're going to use Python as the programming language, and we're going to call our project Skynet as an example. Um, however, um, this program by initial boot.sh uh, supports many optional arguments and we'll see some of those later on. Um, so that raises an important question though, which is how do you run this um, by initial boot.sh um, when it is not yet installed on your computer? So if you're fresh to using by initial, you won't have this program installed. Um, there are a number of ways you can run this program. You can run it through a Docker container. Um, you can download it manually to your computer and run it um, through Bash directly, or you can use a program called curl um, to download and run it automatically. And we'll demonstrate this method today. And I should mention that um, as a prerequisite to using Binisho, um, you're required to have an operating system that is Unix-like. So it runs on Linux and um, Apple OS X. Um, and it, it um, support for Windows is minimal. Um, and it depends on your setup with Windows, whether you can get it to work. So predominantly, it's intended to work with Unix-like operating systems. So um, we're going to start following some commands now. And these commands are reproduced on the slides here. Um, and normally, you would see these being typed in um, in a demonstration, but for the purposes of the webinar, to make sure that um, uh, we can get through this um, relatively quickly, um, I've just copied the commands into the slides, but you could type these into your computer directly and they should work. Um, remembering that the dollar sign indicates the, the command line prompt. So this first thing here is quite long. Um, it's the URL for the um, script by initio boot.sh, which resides on GitHub. And so this is the URL for it on GitHub. Um, oftentimes we create a shorter URL for this, but this is the actual full version. Um, you can you can down you can just go to that in your browser and have a look at it. Um, here, what we're doing is assigning the URL to a variable in our command line. In this case, the variable is called URL in capital letters, and we're going to use it um, in the next command. So, just assigning it to a variable makes the next command um, nice and short. So, what we do here is we supply um, the uh, URL as a shell variable to curl, which downloads the bioinitio boot.sh um, script to our computer. So that's what curl does. And then we pipe the output of curl into the bash interpreter. 
And so what that is going to do is execute bioinitio boot.sh inside bash immediately for us. And then we pass command line arguments to the shell script um, that are expected by bioinitio boot.sh. So um, here we're saying, these are the command line arguments we saw before. We're saying that we want to use Python as the implementation language and we want to create a new project called Skynet. So once that's executed, you'll get a new directory called Skynet on your computer. And here I am illustrating the output of a command called tree, which just draws a, um, a file tree um, for a particular directory. And I've asked it to print out all the files. And so we can see this is the contents of what has been created by byinitio.boot, sorry, boot.sh. Um, and uh, this will differ depending on the programming language that you choose for your implementation. Most of it's the same, but as we'll see, um, a few things are different depending on what language you've chosen. In this case, again, we're using Python. Um, so every uh, new repository or project created by byinitio um, contains a Git repository. Um, we're not going to go into the contents of this. This is just created by Git and it contains um, lots of different files. We've abbreviated it for the sake of this slide. Um, so when you start a new project using Bionitio, it automatically commits all the code into a fresh repository um, with a pristine commit history. Um, here we have a directory called .travis, which contains files that are needed for continuous integration testing with the Travis CI tool. We will talk about that later on. Um, we have support for a Docker container uh, via a Docker file. We're not going to show the use of the Docker container today um, due to time limitations, but um, if you're interested, you can consult our publication uh, in GigaScience. We have a standard open source license. Um, by default, if you don't ask for anything particular, um, Bionitio creates a, um, a three clause BSD license, which is a commonly used open source license. Um, but you can choose different licenses with the minus C flag um, to Bionitio boot.sh. Um, we're not going to show alternative licenses, um, but you can pick from the commonly used open source uh, licenses there. All the user, main user documentation for the new project is contained in a readme file in markdown format, so readme.md. Um, and as I mentioned before, this contains uh, information about how to install and use the program. And as we'll see, if we, um, if we create a remote repository on GitHub, which we can do automatically with Bionitio, then the readme file becomes quite useful and visible on the internet. Uh, we have uh, a directory called functional tests, which contains testing scripts and data for testing. And we'll talk about that a lot more later on. Um, here we have uh, Python specific installation scripts and data. These are necessary for um, Python to install the program on our computer. And as I said, depending on the programming language you use, there may be different um, setup uh, installation scripts for that language. And lastly, or second lastly, we have the, uh, the actual Python source code in a directory called Skynet. The name of this directory will change depending on the name of your project. And these are the, the files that are relevant for Python. Um, we're not gonna look in detail at the code there, but you're welcome to look at that in your leisure. Um, if you try it out. And lastly, uh, we have support for the common workflow language. Again, I'm not going to go into details about that today, but that is useful if you want to incorporate your program into a new uh, bioinformatics pipeline. Okay, so with the previous command, um, we created a new project and that um, made something new on our computer. But normally, it's quite useful to be able to create a, a remote repository on GitHub um, at the same time. You could do this manually with git commands if you wanted to, if you're familiar with that. Um, although Bionitio can do it for you, so it's quite handy. This does assume that you have a GitHub account already and those are free for um, academic use. And so you can easily get a GitHub um, account if you don't already have one. And so um, most of this command is actually the same as before. So we have set a, a bash shell variable called URL and we've assigned it to the URL of the Bionitio boot.sh script. And then we've um, called the curl program on that URL and output, um, piped its output to bash and specified that we want to use Python uh, as the programming language and we want to call the project Skynet. However, you can see there's a line continuation here where we've supplied a few more arguments. 
Firstly, we supply the minus G argument, which um, we, where we give our GitHub username. In this case, in this example, I've used the username Cyberdyne. It's not a real example. It's just for the sake of these slides. Here, you would replace your own GitHub username um, over Cyberdyne. So you place this with whatever your GitHub username is. And so this is just telling um, the uh, buyinitio boot.sh uh, program that you um, want to create a new GitHub um, remote repository. You don't have to do this, but it's useful to supply an optional author name with the minus A flag, uh, and also an optional email address. The author name and email address will be substituted into the files in your project in appropriate locations, which is useful for documentation purposes. For example, at the top of each of the source code files, your username and email address will be uh, inserted, which will be helpful for people who are um, reading the code later on. No, those are not required um, for the sake of creating a GitHub remote repository. All you need to do is supply minus G and then your GitHub username. So if you execute this command, um, it will take a, a moment um, and then it will uh, create the new project on GitHub for you. And as I said, you should replace the GitHub username, author name and email address with appropriate values for yourself. So if that uh, runs successfully, then um, you will see a new project created on GitHub. Here it's under BJ Pop, which is my GitHub username. Um, if this was following the example correctly, um, it should be um, Cyberdyne, um, as was used in the um, previous example here. If I go back, um, that would be the, the username we'd expect to see, but to make it real, I've actually created it on my own, own GitHub project for the sake of this slide. Um, but you can see that it's created a new project with the appropriate project name. You can see the files listed here um, in blue um, that are the contents of the repository. Um, and a key thing is that the license is easy to find. You can see the license um, in the repository and it's also linked in the user documentation. Um, uh, in this particular case that it was created under the term, in this example that I'm showing here, it was created under the terms of the MIT license. So this would vary depending on what kind of license you have chosen. Um, and the README documentation, um, which we, if you scroll down through this page on um, your web browser, you would see useful information about installing um, the program and how to use it. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is um, install and test out the new project. So it's one thing to create a new project, but we would actually like to try it out on our computer. Um, and so we're going to do this via Python. And so there are a few Python specific tests, uh, so steps to run here. Um, the first thing is to create a virtual environment, which is some, a feature that the Python programming language provides. And we're gonna use Python 3, which is the latest version of Python. Uh, and the minus M V N um, command line arguments to Python 3 create a new virtual environment. Um, and we're going to call the environment Skynet dev. Um, and virtual environments are basically a kind of sandboxed environment where um, all of your software is installed into a specific directory and its dependencies are installed there as well. So that if that environment requires libraries to be installed, those are included in that location in the sandbox. And most importantly, they do not affect your system-wide standard uh, library installation. So it's a nice way of, of testing something out without interfering with whatever software is installed on your computer at the same time. And you can easily remove that sandbox at any time and it won't affect the rest of your system. Not every programming language provides virtual environments like this. So this is specific to Python. Here we're going to activate the uh, virtual environment using a bash shell command source, which just runs a script. Once that's activated, any command we execute relevant for the virtual environment um, refers to this Skynet dev. So once that's done, uh, the uh, prompt on the command line changes and we see the, uh, the name of the virtual environment in parentheses before the Unix command line prompt. That, so this is just telling us that the, um, the virtual environment has been activated. And most importantly, that means that when we want to install our software, which is Skynet, um, we're installing into this sandbox. And so, like I said, that's not going to interfere with other software that's on the system. Uh, PIP is the tool that Python uh, uses for installing software by default. Um, the software we're going to install is this Skynet software, which I'm assuming is in the same 
directory that we're running this at the moment, and it would be um, if we executed the commands in these slides. Um, it has been created, remember, by the byinitio-boot um, dot sh um, program. So that's the directory that was created by by initio. The minus capital U just is a convenience which says update this no matter what. So it means it will overwrite this um, regardless of its current state. You don't need the minus capital U by default, but it's sometimes handy to have. Um, okay, and then uh, it's actually installed after the previous command. And so now we have a program called Skynet in our environment that we can run just by naming the program. Uh, in this case, we're gonna test it out first by asking for the version of the program. And we can see the version number printed out on the, the um, display in the terminal. And so this is illustrating one of the useful things about Skynet is the template program that you create as a version number, it starts off by this version number here. Uh, and that's a handy feature to have. We can also um, run the program by asking for command line help with minus H flag. Um, as we do here, so print help message, and then the usage message for the program is displayed on the terminal. Again, that illustrates a nice feature of Skynet, which is, uh, sorry, of Bionitio, which is that it um, comes with command line argument parsing um, built in. Obviously, you may modify that for your own purposes, but uh, it's quite nice that it's already there as an example. So it's much easier to modify than starting from scratch. Okay, so now we're going to actually, now that we've got the program installed inside a virtual environment, we're gonna try running it on some sample test data and check that it's working correctly. For um, the convenience in these slides, I'm going to assign a shell variable called topdir and it's gonna be equal to the current working directory. I just run the, com the Unix command print working directory or PWD and I save the result in a shell variable. And I'll, use, I'll refer to this in some subsequent commands, which is just making it easy to refer to the same location. Um, and it will make it also easy if you want to follow along on your own computer, and, but you're doing this in a different directory than I am. Okay, so um, inside the um, newly created project called Skynet, there's a directory called functional tests, as I mentioned before, and there's some test data. We're going to change into that directory and uh, we're going to run the Skynet program on a file called toSequence.fastA, which is a FastA file with two sequences in it, as the name suggests. Uh, and we're gonna see that it outputs some, um, a header line and uh, the name of the file followed by some statistics. So that would be what would happen if you ran the program on that particular file. So the test data was created um, for the purposes of testing this project out and there's various test files in that um, functional tests um, directory. Okay, another thing you'll find in the um, test data is um, expected outputs. So we've got the actual inputs that programs run on and then we've got um, called toSequence.fastA, we've got the output that the program generates and then we've got the output that we expect to see if the program runs correctly. So this was created in advance and so um, it's helpful for testing. So we can compare the actual output of the program with the output that we expect to see. And if they're the same, then the program is um, running correctly. And in this case, you can see that the outputs are the same. And so uh, we build our confidence that the program is doing what it ought to do. Okay, but running the program by hand um, can be tedious and it's not um, a, a, a good way to test the software out on many different test examples. And so obviously what we really wanna do is automate those tests so that we can make it more efficient. We can add new test cases quite easily and um, update the testing without having to do manual work. And so um, Bionitio creates a new testing script for you as well called um, um, something.testsh and it, the something is the name of the project you've created. So in our case here, it's skynet-test.sh. That's the name of the script and it exists in the, the functional tests subdirectory. And you specify uh, the name of the, the um, program you wanna run, in this case, Skynet, and you specify the directory containing the test data um, and it will run the program on each of the test data and it will report um, how well that test has gone, if it succeeded or failed. And the minus V option for the testing script is um, to turn on verbose mode. Um, and the verbose mode just means that it prints uh, a message for each test that it's running. 
if you don't specify minus V, then it will um, be silent um, out on the testing. Um, but for interactive use, you probably want to see the outputs of the tests. Um, if it's silent, uh, really the um, only thing that would be of interest is the exit status of the testing script. Um, and so the exit status is zero if um, all of the tests succeed. And zero is um, the convention that the, the Unix shell uses for a su successful execution of a program. Um, if any one of the test cases fails, then the testing script returns a status of one. And so this is useful um, for other systems that might run the test script. Um, for example, the Travis continuous in integration testing, um, because Travis will test the output of this script. And if that status is zero, then Travis will know that the testing has succeeded. If the status is one, then Travis will know that the testing has failed. Um, and just down here, I've echoed the output of dollar question mark, which is the, the um, Unix shells um, variable that tells us what the exit status of the most recently executed command was. And here we see it's zero, showing that all of the tests have succeeded. Um, so that testing script allows us to run a, a script on the command line. Um, but what we can do now is connect it to continuous integration testing um, and we're going to use the Travis CI system um, to do this automatically for us. And Travis CI is a continuous integration testing um, website. Um, it works automatically with GitHub. So if you have a GitHub account, you can connect it to your um, GitHub account in a straightforward way, as we'll see. Um, and it, GitHub, uh, Travis testing is um, free um, for open source projects. Um, so that's quite nice. You don't have to pay for anything to use the service um, and it comes with lots of features. So it's a really fantastic uh, thing to have. And so that's why it's supported by Bionitio. Um, and uh, so we're going to see in a moment uh, how to create um, a Travis um, account if you don't already have one um, and then activate Travis testing um, for our repository. And so the first thing to do is go to the travis-ci.org website uh, and sign in with your GitHub account. So there's a button in the right hand top of the screen um, that says sign in with GitHub. You can click on that and then it will ask for your um, credentials and then you may log in through um, GitHub. Once you're connected um, into your GitHub account, then you can access Travis um, straight away. And so I've already got a, a Travis um, account um, that's connected to my GitHub. Um, and so when I log in, I can see um, an icon for my account, which is my picture and my name. Um, and uh, it's called my profile. And so, um, so it's, it, it occurs in the top right hand corner of the screen. So you click on the profile picture uh, and select profile from the drop down menu. Um, and after doing that, you'll see a list of all your repositories that you have on GitHub. Uh, and if you've created one with uh, Bionitio, you'll see your new repository there. Uh, in this case, it will be called Skynet for our example. Um, if your new project is not listed, um, then um, it's possible that uh, Travis hasn't synchronized with GitHub. And so there's a button just to do this called Sync Account. If you just click on that button, it will refresh the list of your repositories. Uh, in my particular example, there will be a big long list of repositories that I have, which I don't show all of them here. Uh, and you need to search through that list if you've got a few already to find the project you're interested in. In this case, it's Skynet um, from our example. And you can see by default um, that it's not activated for Travis testing. So the, the activation button is grayed out. All you have to do to activate it is click on that button and it becomes a green tick and then you're ready to go. So then, then basically after doing this, Travis knows that it should monitor activity on your, on your Skynet um, GitHub repository and changes that happen to this project trigger um, running the tests. So this is a really useful feature to have in your project. Um, basically what it means is each time you make a commit to the repository, um, it, Travis will um, start testing the code. And so it will run your determined um, testing script, which is configured in by initio automatically, and it will run the test cases for you and it will tell you if any of the testing failed or if all the tests succeeded. And so you can 
use this to check that each new change you make to your repository doesn't break the code as it is on um, uh, GitHub. And so one thing that's important to know is that once you've connected Travis to your um, GitHub project, it won't run the tests until the next commit to the project is made. Um, so in order to do that, we'll um, demonstrate its behavior in these slides um, by creating a, a, an error in the code on purpose uh, and we'll commit that change and we'll see what effect it has on, on Travis. Okay, so what we're gonna do is change into the directory that contains the Python source code, which is in the um, Skynet directory um, in, in the directory tree. Uh, we're gonna copy the existing skynet.py source code, which is the correct version of the program. We're gonna copy it to something skynet.py.old. We're gonna um, revert the changes back later on, so it's useful to have a copy of that code available. Um, Okay, so after doing that, what we're gonna do is delete line 230 from the code and overwrite the Python code with the erroneous version and commit the changes uh, and push them to GitHub. Um, so you might wonder why delete line 30. I just happen to know in advance that line 230 has an important piece of code on it. That line prints out the heading in the output of the, the um, program. And if we delete it, then our testing is not gonna work because it expects the uh, heading to be there. So by deleting that line using the said command, um, deleting line 230 removes that functionality, functionality from the program. Um, okay, so what we've done is we've modified the program, we've introduced an error, we've copied the erroneous program over the top of the original program, and we've committed the changes to GitHub using the git commit command. And then we've pushed those changes to the uh, remote repository using git push origin master, which is the command for git to push our code to our remote repository on GitHub. Okay. And after a moment, so uh, Travis doesn't run the tests um, immediately, um, but it will eventually um, run the tests. And so you might have to wait a few seconds before it starts. But after that commit has been changed, it will notice that um, that the, uh, the um, sorry, after the commit has been made, we'll notice that the changes have been made to the repository and it will then trigger running our um, testing script. So it's going to execute exactly that same test script that I showed you from the command line, run all the same tests. Uh, and you'll notice that if, well, if it fails, um, Travis tells you, if you go to the page on um, Travis for your project, it will say that uh, an error has happened. You can see that with the red marks, um, and it says that this has failed. And then inside the uh, Travis page, you can see the output from your testing script. So this is output that's from the Travis CI website. And you can see that it uh, is telling us that Skynet testing failed six out of eight tests. And in our testing script, what you can see is that when it fails, um, it tells you what command it was running. It tells you what the actual output was. So it's, it shows us this is what the program produced. And then it also tells us what the expected output was. So it prints out what we were expecting to see. And then it tells us the difference is that um, the uh, actual output was missing um, the header from the expected output. And that's exactly what we expect to see because we on purpose removed the piece of code that printed the header out. Okay, so we've created an error. We've committed it to GitHub. That's triggered Travis testing. And um, Travis has run our test script and it's reported an error for us. And if you go to the GitHub page for the project and you look at the README, you can see that it has a little badge. Um, this badge will be updated to say that the build is failing um, and this is connected to Travis. So our README documentation has a special URL in it that links it to Travis. And so when the tests fail, you can easily get a um, overview of that by just seeing here that it, it fails. So that's a nice feature. You should also get an email from Travis um, telling you that your recent commit has failed. And it shows you the commit log message for that particular commit that caused the, the problem. And this was the one where introduce an error on purpose. That was what I typed into the git, git com commit message. So that's nice. We've introduced a failure and then Travis has told us about it. Obviously in real life, you won't be introducing errors on purpose. Um, however, errors do sometimes happen in our code and it's useful to get notified about it. 
Okay, so now we're going to fix that error um, simply by copying um, the original pro program, um, which was saved as skynet.py.old. We're going to copy that back over to skynet.py uh, and revert the, the code to its correct version. I'm going to commit that correction. So that's just undoing the previous intentional error. And then we're going to push that back to um, the remote repository on GitHub. Um, and that will that commit will trigger Travis to re-execute the testing once again. And if we wait a moment for Travis to um, notice that the commit has happened and to start the testing, eventually it will run the test case. And then um, having corrected the error, we now see that we get the green tick uh, indicating that the testing has now passed. And we can see the output on the Travis page for all our test cases. And now it's working um, as we expected, which is great. Also, um, our README gets updated. And so the badge connecting to Travis indicates that testing uh, has passed again. So we get the green badge, which is nice. Um, and anyone looking at the code can see that it's passing testing, which is a good sign. Uh, and you also get an email about the success from Travis, uh, telling you that you fixed um, the problem. Um, and if you're working with anybody else on the code, um, obviously you can uh, work with them using GitHub and um, share the development. Um, and if they introduce errors into the pro into the code, you will see the errors reported as well. Um, so you can learn about errors introduced by other people working on the code. Um, you can also uh, create um, um, branches uh, and uh, do development inside a branch. And then Travis will track the branches as well, so automatically. So any development in a branch in your code will also do have the same functionality. And the branches are separate testing from the uh, from each other, which is very good. Okay, so we're drawing uh, close to the end now. So I'll just conclude. Um, so Binary Show takes a very pragmatic approach to solving the software scientific software crisis. So um, in the sense, it's pragmatic in the sense that it tries to actually take a lot of the advice that you see in the literature and put it into practice. And it does that by um, creating a template that has um, good practices built in from the start. Um, and we want to help bioinformaticians develop good habits early on and use them all the time, even for small scripts. So I use Bioinitio all the time. Um, nowadays, when I want to create a new project, even if it's for a small script that I think is only going to be used briefly, I um, use Bioinitio to create a new project for me um, because it has everything built in. So I get started much more quickly and it includes key things that I might skip over um, in the interest of being in a hurry. Um, and sometimes I regret that. And so it's useful to have it there from the start. And particularly, particularly um, things relating to testing uh, is very useful and um, quite time consuming to set up um, each time for a new project. And so I guess in final remark to make is that Bionisio uh, both illustrates good practices and makes them easy to use. And so hopefully um, you've been uh, motivated to try it out yourself. And so you can follow along these slides or you can go and check out our GitHub page and we where we have more details and uh, more illustration of examples of using the tool. And you can also read our paper on um, GigaScience for some background. I'd like to thank the authors of Bionitio, who are listed here, um, for helping out with the development of the software and for the creation of these slides. Um, I'd like to thank the Australian BioCommons for hosting this webinar and inviting me to present, um, particularly Christina Hall. Um, I'd like to thank Melbourne Bioinformatics, where I work, and um, lastly, the Department of Health and Human Services in the state of Victoria for funding my position. Um, so we'll now go into a section where we may have some questions. And thank you very much. Um, so the first question is, um, is it easy to integrate with Circle CI, which is a different continuous integration testing system instead of Travis? Um, the, the answer is that um, we only support Travis at the moment um, automatically. So there are, there are no special features for integrating with any other continuous integration systems. Um, though it is a good idea to try and support others. If you wanted to use Circle CI, then you would need to set it up specifically for that system instead. Um, so yeah, not at the moment, but a great question. Uh, we use Travis because it's, it's quite well integrated with GitHub. Um, 
So, and the second question is, um, how does it help with tracking dependencies? So I think this question is about software dependencies in the development of the code. That depends on the programming language you're using. Um, and so different programming languages have different ways of supporting dependencies. If you're using Python, as we did in today's example, then um, the, the project comes with a setup.py script, which contains the um, dependencies needed for the example template. I guess the key thing there is it has all the syntax ready for you. So all you have to do is change the dependencies to what you need them to be. So that's a small amount of changes. Um, it would obviously depend on what you want um, to use. So for example, if you wanted to add um, graph plotting to the Python code, you might want to use matplotlib, in which case you would add a matplotlib to the setup.py file. Um, but uh, the main thing there is that you don't have to create the entire file for yourself and remember the syntax for it and so on. You can just fill in the details. Um, and I, I um, forget a lot of those details myself, and so um, it's useful just to have that um, ready to go, um, rather than having to remember exactly and look it up all the time. Uh, okay, and so there was another question which was, um, of pipenv VN, Vinconda, um, why I use VN? Um, that I have no particular reason to use VM. So unfortunately, this question is, I should say, is um, about using Python. Um, and Python comes with many different ways of creating virtual environments um, and, uh, and installing software systems. Uh, I'm just using um, VM because that's built into Python and it's a reasonably good way to do it. Um, but you can choose your own and that's uh, independent of Bionitio. So you, can, you don't have to use virtual environments for Python. Like I said, each programming language has its own way of doing those things, so you need to know how that language works in that case. And the, there's 12 languages supported by Bionitio, um, so that all of the standard ones are supported, such as C, C++, Java, Python, as we saw, R, um, and, with, and Perl, um, and those are commonly used in bioinformatics. We've also got JavaScript um, and we've got a few um, less standardly used languages, but some interesting ones, including Haskell, um, Rust, um, and um, Ruby. And I, another thing you can do with Binary Show is you can, um, you can um, compare the implementations and they all implement exactly the same software. Um, so they all do exactly the same thing. Um, so it's interesting to compare how you would do it in different programming languages. Um, and one of the things of supporting all those different programming languages is Binary has to be generic enough that every programming language um, carries out the same task. And so that explains some of the reasons why we've implemented things in the way they are, is so that we can support all those different languages without being specifically tied to a particular programming language. Okay, well, that's all we have time for today. So I'd like to once again express our appreciation to you, Bernie, for sharing your work with us today and draw the presentation to a close. That was a pleasure. And thank you, Christina, for hosting me. And thanks for everyone for joining in and anyone who's watching um, online. Um, thanks for trying out by Thank you. Now, before leaving today, I'd like to mention our next webinar in the series. So you can register now on our website for the essence of data visualization in bioinformatics with Martin Krasinski in February. So thanks once again for watching. We hope you found it useful. And thanks also goes to our funding organization. The Australian BioCommons is enabled by NCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Until next time, goodbye.